Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with an absolutely splendid, or mostly splendid, okay, it has its one or two little thingies, but, you know, doesn't everything, a fabulous box of Hugo Alfin on Naxos. They've really done a nice job. You know, Naxos makes nice boxes. They're sturdy, they're attractive, they're, 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 you can, like, open them and stuff doesn't fall out all over the place. You get a really decent booklet. I mean, this is, this is, Absolutely top quality stuff. And here we have seven, one, two, three, six. Seven discs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Pardon me. Yes. Seven discs of Alfin with a well, six discs and a bonus disc. Now, Hugo Alfin lived from 1872 to 1960. And you get his complete symphonies. There are five of them. And of all a whole passel of other orchestral works. Now, let's be honest. He was, for many, many, many years, considered to be the Swedish composer on the, on the evidence of one work, the Midsummer Markava, Markvaft, whatever it's called, the Midsummer tone poem thing. Actually, it's here somewhere, isn't it? Um, it's got to be here. It absolutely has to be here. It has to be here. Where is it? Oh, my God. No, it's on the, it's on the bonus disc. Bonus disc, which is disc number seven. Let's see what's here on disc number seven. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, there it is. Midsummer, Midsummer Vaca. That's what it's called. Or the Swedish Rhapsody number one. How's that? Isn't that easier? Swedish Rhapsody number one. I mean, you know, you do, you do, a, you do a country Rhapsody, right? And Esco had the Romanian Rhapsody. It listed a Hungarian Rhapsody. You know, if you do a Rhapsody, that's going to be your piece. The only one who didn't achieve that was Dvorak with his Slavonic Rhapsodies, which aren't his most popular pieces. Rather interesting. Anyway, that's a, that's a digression. Um, Alfin was famous because of that. That was his sort of, you know, calling card. And nobody knew any other Swedish composers anyway. So they said, oh, I know the Swedish Rhapsody. It's by that guy. What's his name? You know, um, Alvin, like the chipmunks, right? No, Alfen, A-L-F-V-E-N. So that was it. But he wrote a lot of other music. Well, now that the record explosion has exploded, we have all of that other music. And there are two Alphen symphony cycles. There's Nimi Yarvi's on Bis, which was licensed to Brilliant Classics, which is very, very good. Um, and in some respects, better than this one. In other respects, not. And, and then there's, there's, there's this, this pile. Now, Alphen was not, quite frankly, a symphonist. That wasn't his thing. It just wasn't his thing. The five symphonies are patchy. Um, and, you know, that's what you discover when you dig into these people. Sometimes they're better off if they only have one work as their calling card. But no, this isn't true. Because he was a very good composer of colorful, programmatic, symphonic poem. Things like the Swedish Rhapsody, for example. And not all the symphonies are bad. They're really not. They get better as they go. He got better as he went. His first symphony is a hopelessly derivative sort of farrago of nonsense and uninteresting ideas. And it gets the worst performance on the disc, actually, on the, in the set. It, it gets a rather flabby and, and uninteresting an interesting interpretation, because the piece really needs as much help as you can give it, and Yarvi is much better for that. But elsewhere, it's really smooth sailing. So let's see what we get here, shall we? We have disc number one. Yeah, of course we do, because we have six discs. You get symphony number one. It's a snooze. I'm sorry. It's just not very good. It was 1897 and revised 1903, 1904. And you wonder why he bothered, because, well, it may have been even worse when he started. Who knows? But then you get the Swedish Rhapsody number two, the Uppsala Rhapsody, which is lovely, and the Suite from the Mountain King. I said, you know, Grieg, that Mountain King? Well, you know, there are lots of mountain kings in Scandinavia because they have lots of mountains. So each one needs a king, obviously. And then we have his festival overture. This is all good, fun stuff, um, except for the symphony. Disc number two, the suite from the prodigal son. Gorgeous. Beautiful, beautiful work. Absolutely lovely. It's a ballet. I want to hear the whole thing. I really do. Um, symphony number two, um, that ends with like a big, nasty fugue. It's 53 minutes long. It's very ambitious. Does Alfin actually fill up all 53 minutes with music that is worthy of his ambition? Well... Not really, but he's getting there. It's, it's definitely better than symphony number one. And then we get, let's see, oh, the, the, the Dalekarlian Rhapsody, or Car, Car, yeah, something like that. Swedish Rhapsody number three. 
That's a lot easier. Another lovely work at big, 25 minutes long. Wow, it's a big sucker. And then we have A Legend of the Scaries, a symphonic poem, quite beautiful, from 1904, the same year he revised the, four, the first symphony. And if you listen to this and listen to that, you will see why I say he's not really a symphonist. He was much happier in these free-form programmatic works where he could just indulge his love of, 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 of simple tunes and beautiful orchestration. It's wonderful. And symphony number three from 1905. Well, that's slimmed down from 53 minutes to 35 minutes. All to the good. He's getting there. He's getting himself together. It's much better. And then we have, let's see, this disc, symphony number five. Why is this? That's yeah, number five. Oh, disc five. Wait a minute. Let's do these in numeric. They're not in numerical order. I was playing with them and I put them all back randomly. Symphony number four from the outermost scaries. Lots of scaries in Sweden. You know, those little island chain things on the coast. Um, this is quite lovely. This is his most famous symphony. It has a, a tenor and a soprano vocalese. They're all going, ah, 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 while the orchestra is doing this big, passionate sort of faux Richard Straussian rhapsodizing. It's probably his best symphony because it's not really a symphony. It's a big tone poem. And, and you don't have to worry about little details like form. You just let it wash over you. It's a little long for its material. I think it's 48 minutes in this performance, but, but beautiful all the way through. And another festival overture, Opus 52. There we had a lot of festivals in Sweden. They're always having a festival, I guess. Now, we get symphony number five, 53 minutes. Uh-oh, here we go again. But no, by this time, which was 1942 to 52, he spent 10 years working on it. You know, even more evidence that he was not really a symphonist, but this is not a bad work. It's a good piece. It really, it sustains its length and the music is characterful and fun. And, and I think he finally sort of got it, you know, where it was going. I mean, yeah, development wasn't his specialty, but it's a good piece. It really is a good, solid piece. And then we have the, the, the Revelation Cantata for, for harp, celesta, and strings. It's only three minutes and 49 seconds long. What's not to love? And then let's see what do we have here. Disc number six. We have the suite for music for the film. Oh, my goodness. This the film. Um, Never mind. Some film thing. Um, and then there's another film thing, a country tale suite. These were arranged. Well, that's, that's by him. And the, the Sin of Solbev suite is arranged by E. Hladish for Chamber Orchestra in 1939. It's beautiful film music. It's really kind of cool, a little sort of niche in the world of film music. Even, what oh, couldn't it? Here, you pronounce it. There it is, okay? I mean, see the problem there? You know, you Swedish people can do it. I'm, I'm not bothering. And then we have, let's see, what is this? The Elegy at Emil, Emil Sjögren's Funeral. 12 minutes of elegy. Okay, I'll, I can buy it. It's a nice elegy. It's very elegiac. And let's see, what is this? Oh, that goes here. And then finally, oh, this is disc five, right? I'm putting them back in order again, because otherwise, there. I'll be annoyed. Okay, then we get Swedish orchestral favorites, which is wonderful because you get Söderman and Stenhammer and Lars Erik Larsson and, and Wilhelm Peterson Berger and Hugo Alfin, well, that's our guy, and Dag Viren, the March from the Serenade for Strings. They should do the whole serenade. It's so lovely. And more Alfin, some of the stuff that's on here, but the point is to get the Swedish Rhapsody number one. It turns out there's lots of good Swedish composers. Who knew? Right, including Doug Fearon, who's wonderful, but who wrote, you know, not so much music, and Alan Pedersen, who is not appearing on Swedish orchestral favorites, because you, first of all, you have to have the whole record devoted to it, and second of all, you don't want people to commit suicide after listening to it, and and uh, you know, there's like some really good people in there, and of course, of course, who could forget, who could forget, you know. Kurt Atterberg, ooh, he's the symphonist. Well, I mean, more symphonically than, you know, than, than Alfin was in any case. But, you know, there's lots of good Swedish music out there. There really is. There's more than Alfin, but, you know, it's nice to go back to our roots. And this is a beautiful set, an absolutely lovely set, which I recommend accordingly. 
Go for it, folks. Go forth and listen. You'll enjoy it. It's beautiful, romantic, colorful, nationalistic music. I mean, what's not to like? Really? Whatever quibbles I may have, you know, they're irrelevant. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.